So the first keynote of the World Building Congress here in Brisbane in 2013 is to be delivered by Professor Martin Fisher. I first met Martin at Stanford University in 1991 and we've been collaborating ever since. Martin first came to Australia as QUT's visiting professor in March 1996, some 17 years ago, his first visit to Down Under, and we haven't been able to keep him away ever since. And what I've done is, uh, in cleaning out my, uh, my office the other day, I came across this gem, and it's a uh, VHS video called 4D CAD Design and Project Management, Martin Fisher at QUT, 29th of March 1996. This should go into the National Archives, I appreciate. And so what we've done is, with the help of some technology, we've digitised some of this. And I want to hold Martin to account this morning some of the promises that he made in 1996. Also, I want to draw attention, as you see some of these clips, to his high fashion tie, a strange piece of equipment called an overhead projector, and the wisdom finally showing through with the colour of his hair but at least he has hair. Martin is a global leader supporting the architecture, engineering and construction industry and has made valuable contributions to research projects undertaken by the CRC for Construction Innovation at QUT since 2001 and now Australia's Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre. Martin is a Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University. He's also Director of the Centre for Integrated Facility Engineering, lovingly known as SIFI, one of the world's leading industry-sponsored research centres in virtual design and construction. He's known globally for his leadership in developing virtual 4D modelling to improve project planning, enhance facility life cycle performance, increasing the productivity of project teams and furthering the sustainability of the built environment. He holds a PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering and a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering from Stanford University and a Diploma in Civil Engineering from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne in Switzerland. Please join me in welcoming Martin Fisher. And uh, but before I did that, I wanted to show you one short slide, um, if we can, uh, that uh, is the first of three. These are all uh, un, uh, unseen by Martin, and there are two more just to help some questions as we get to the last minute, last ten minutes of this session. As engineers, we depend on models that represent reality as close as possible to communicate our work, to visualize our work, and to analyze our work. The CPM schedule was somewhat of an advancement over Bauchal's schedule, since now you could look at the logic of the work and you could look at the critical path, and you got a little bit more insight into your plan, you could inspect the model and you could get a little bit more out of the model. Uh, I think the 4D model is sort of the next step that allows you to get more insight into the time-space relationships of what you're doing. And in essence, I think architects, engineers, and contractors find the business of transforming space over time. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Fisher. Thanks, Keith, uh, for having me, having us. Um, and uh, you can all now see uh, whether you want to believe me or not, given you know, what I said 17 years ago, and uh, what I'm going to say, um, where I see things going from here on out. Um, but uh, thank you, um, CIB, QUT, SBNRC, as the co-hosts of this uh, Congress, for getting us all here together. And, uh, and thank you, Wim, John, John, and others for the service in, that you give to our community uh, as uh, leaders of the CIB. So I uh, titled my talk, Build Your Project a Thousand Times Virtually Before Building It in Reality. You might say, this is really crazy now. Um, we just have to build it once, right. Um, but as we will see, I think, uh, what we can do beyond what we could do in 1996 is actually look at many, many, many thousands of options of how we might construct the project versus at a time where we could look at just a few options. So to build on the theme of the conference, of the Congress, um, how I see the contribution of construction to society is rebuild society's fixed physical wealth. 
So, which is, of course, a cool thing. So, as a community, therefore, we have to optimize the performance of that fixed physical wealth. Otherwise, it's not a very good contribution to society. And obviously, we hear about a lot of opportunities, also challenges uh, of the built environment. So why do we come up short? In my mind, we come up short because of how we organize ourselves. And we come up short because we are not making very good predictions of the impact of our buildings and infrastructure in the future in the dimensions of economic, environmental, and social uh, performance. So my talk is really grouped into these two uh, buckets. I will show how we can organize ourselves better, orchestrate the intelligence of the team and the knowledge of the team much better uh, with the use of the methods and tools that many of us, uh, most of us, have developed over the last 20 years or so. And then I'll show where things are going um, with a couple snapshots from our research lab. And there you'll see, um, actually for the first time presented outside, where we see faulty CAD going beyond what I talked about in 1996. So our predictions really don't always turn out the way we would like them to turn out. Um, this, I think, is a stock memory from just 50 years ago, uh, where um, the company that later became part of Exxon um, proudly announced uh, in a big ad in a magazine, each day Humboldt supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. They were very proud of that at the time. And unfortunately, it has actually become true, yeah, or stay true. So, um, to give you an idea where I'm speaking from, um, it's a bit of a logo soup here, um, but um, not that you need to take it all in, but I'm thankful to the companies that have supported us or currently supporting us at SAIFI, um, that really has allowed us to do the work that we've been able to do. And uh, we are, have been 100% industry funded for 25 years uh, from really all the stakeholders in the construction industry. And in the 90s, as you may know, and as many of you were as well, we were very active in building information modeling. That really is what we did, the technology of building information modeling. As that matured and came into the market, we put building information modeling into the context of what, as put it together as a method, which we call virtual design and construction, which includes building information modeling, but is more than that. And as this is now being adopted by leading companies, uh, we are starting to focus really on optimizing facility performance. So it has been a great pleasure to collaborate um, with QUT, with SBNRC, with um, before CERC, um, to reinvent as a community the next practice. Because I think that's what we have to do if we want to improve the performance of the built environment. Um, and that really takes the synergy of research, education, and understanding practice. And uh, the faster we can go through the cycle of improving practice through research and education, um, the better off all of us will be. So a couple of snapshots of what we tried a few years ago uh, in this collaboration. Um, one of our students, Jen Tobias, with the leadership of John Haymaker, uh, worked with um, practitioners and scientists here in model-based life cycle estimating. Or oh, then uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to work with Robin on a construction planning workbench, uh, trying to create a digital environment, or prototyping a digital environment for construction planning, which now is starting to become a reality, actually. So what I have seen among our membership is in the last five years, a quite dramatic uptake of the practice of virtual design and construction. And I'll more formally uh, describe what that is in a minute. So they've asked us to think about what is then the next practice, because they're busy, still many challenges, as you will also hear tomorrow, I think from Brian Krauss, from Turner, in terms of bringing today's capabilities into everyday practice. Uh, still, the companies we work with, they charged us to take a peek over the horizon, what might be happening later. So hence the two parts of my talk in terms of giving you a case study of where I see the leading practice, and then a couple of vignettes of where I see things going. 
So virtual design and construction consists really of building information modeling and process modeling um, as the foundations. You could also think about it as the digital world and lean construction methods, if that's how you like to uh, put it. We need to put those two tools, techniques, methods into the human environment. At the end of the day, it's us, the people, who make the projects happen. So we've called this method integrated concurrent engineering. Um, learned it from the Czech Propulsion Lab that uses this for the design of uh, space missions. And it's really these three pillars, um, the social, the process management, and the technical methods that make up virtual design and construction. You can try to do virtual design and construction with just one or two of them but you'll be more successful if you use all of them. But what is it all good? So it really depends on the project objectives and the company objectives. So we should be able to achieve better outcomes by using this new method. Okay, so let me dive into the first uh, case study, the first example illustrating how we can much better orchestrate the, the vast knowledge that exists in projects for better outcomes for clients. And some of you have seen this case study before I understand. Uh, I picked the case study from a SciFi member. I wanted to pick just one case study and take you through it. You will see other examples from Brian uh, from Terminal tomorrow. So this, uh, but before I jump into the case study, I want to set a, a framework for it. So the challenge I think with buildings and infrastructure is that it performs as a whole. It has to perform as a whole. But to get it done, we have to, every day, make a work assignment to lots of different people. So we have to break it up into lots of little steps and somehow pray, hope that at the end of the project, we end up with what we actually envisioned at the beginning or even something better. And that doesn't always happen because I feel that we are lacking a strategy and methods for integrating the many viewpoints, uh, disciplines, uh, performance metrics and so on that on a project. So we want a high performance facility, right? To get a high performance facility, we really need to have integrated building systems because a building or a bridge or whatever uh, built environment element you're building will likely perform better when the building systems are integrated, when they work together instead of um, on their own. To get that, we have to integrate the processes that create it. It's ludicrous to think that we can, by miracle, somehow create an integrated product by fragmenting the processes. We can also not expect that the processes will be integrated if the organization is fragmented, so we have to integrate the organization. And we have to integrate the information that the organization is using, because if, again, the information is fragmented, then the team has to work for the information instead of the other way around, the information working for the team. So I would submit that we need a strategy for integration on any project. Because at the end, you want a project that works well as a whole project. Now, to achieve this, we need to use certain methods. We need to define the value of the project in terms of performance metrics. We need to predict, visualize those um, on the basis of building information model. We need to um, have a collaboration method, collocation possibly, and we need to manage the production. And all of it, um, should be put into the framework of some team charter or integrated form of agreement. So this is what we see um, leading project teams uh, in the US doing. Something along these lines. So let me illustrate this with a case study. I'll go pretty fast, um, but I think you'll get the flavor of the team. This is the Suffolk Medical Center of Castro Valley, a $320 million hospital. Um, replacing an older hospital that was no longer structurally sound uh, for earthquake requirements. And you can see some of the statistics. So I want to start with the performance that the team achieved. While I'm using this case study, it's to my knowledge the first case study that is completed where project that is completed where the design, construction, owner team said at the beginning of the project, on this project we will use integrated project delivery supported by building information modeling as much as possible throughout the whole project. There's many projects like this underway, but this one uh, completed a few months ago. So this is what the place looks like. 
And so you can decide if you want to, you know, go to your uh, email or something if you don't find these results exciting. So I wanted to start with the results. So they delivered the space program, essentially the space program that the, the uh, client wanted. At least in the US, I should say, these results seem um, rather, rather special. Um, hospital was built on budget. It was completed six weeks ahead of schedule. Actually, that is not really the whole story. It was construction started seven months later than expected. I'll come back to that. It uh, achieved the lead rating that it was supposed to. 97% uh, of inspections passed the first time. Uh, zero last time. Injury rate over 800, over 800,000 work hours. And tool time or time on the roof phase uh, was 50% better than industry average. Productivity, labor productivity was up 6 to 28 percent, a very bit from the trade between the trades, the key trades on the hospital. Um, manpower peaks were reduced by 35 percent. Rework was down 50 to 95 percent. Again, very bit from discipline to discipline. So I'm sharing these metrics because this team went to the trouble to collect them and also to encourage you to collect metrics and share them. So how did they do this? As I said, at least in the US, these are pretty good results for a hospital project. So let me start with the perspective of the owner, Dick the Christian, the senior project manager for the project on the owner side. He has two phrases that I like quite a lot. He says, I have to, we have to fight the dragon of uncertainty and we have to cut through, overcome the Bermuda Triangle of project delivery. So let me explain this. So here's the dragon of uncertainty. And basically he said there is a couple things the owner has to do and other things that the design construction team has to take care of. The owner has to take care of defining clear goals and create a certain space program. And then the design construction team has to create a clear and clean design, create stable uh, construction, and that should then lead to a successful project. So this is why construction started seven months later because when, according to the typical hospital construction schedule, the project was supposed to start, the owner project manager felt that the space program was not settled enough. And they said, time out, design construction team, we are not ready to launch construction, we're not ready to start detailing the project. Um, we need to finish the space program, so rather than detailing all kinds of things that we're going to change anyway, think about how you're going to build the hospital really fast once it's clear what we need to build. So it took him seven months to get this done. So they started seven months later than typical and still finished six weeks early. So the Bermuda Triangle project delivery looks something like this. Design ends and construction starts, right? And there's some kind of way overlap typically. We're in a hurry to get started, but we're still making design decisions. And then there's a lot of work that needs to happen between when design ends and construction formally starts. So, Digby's point was, look at the point when you release design for construction. There's a lot of things that have to be done, and you should do them beforehand, that if you don't do them beforehand, they will introduce risk later in construction, and likely lead to delays, overruns, and reduction in scope. So, he basically challenged the design construction team to guarantee the production the physical production, fabrication, and installation of all the parts of the project without any risk of rework, schedule delay, cost of runs. So you saw from the metrics they made it with respect to cost, they came close with respect to rework, they made it with respect to schedule. There were lots of decisions the team had to make, and I'll let you just sort of glance at these a little bit uh, in the interest of time. Uh, these are just some of the examples that the team had to sit down and say, what do we do? And you will see what they did. But basically, he challenged the, the project team to become really good at getting to the point of releasing work for construction with basically zero risk of failure. So that's what he said. That's what you need to learn to do really well. So he ended up with the whole scope on budget on schedule, which again for us all is not necessarily typical. So the team sat down and defined what is it that the owner really wants on this project in terms of the right building, predictable outcomes, the consequences of decisions, um, value for money, 
um, the uh, speed of delivery, operating costs, sustainability, rework, injuries, safety. Those were the categories where they defined goals. And they said, you know, we will create the most value when we can reduce costs by people working together and innovating together. So that was sort of the vision that they had for the project team. And they focused on the product itself, but also in the process and organization, how to get this project done. That's really where the bulk of the hard work actually was in terms of the changes. So here, an overview of the main components, uh, virtual building, um, co-located team, collaborative planning, creating a virtual company, and measuring, predicting, and measuring. So they had 11 parties, key parties signed the contract, um, so they were all on the same page. And they were very public in stating the performance objectives. I was pretty surprised when I saw this when I walked into the trailer, when I visited the job once. Target profit, 15 million. Projected profit, 13 million. We can still get 2 million profit if we find a way of saving $2 million. The client has already agreed to pay us $15 million. Right now, the, uh, the total cost was 309. Out of that, $15 million was profit. And so now the project was $2 million more expensive, um, cutting into their profit. So this really led to the first project team that I've ever seen visited that felt like a virtual company, where people actually did work for the project first, and then for their company. So a lot of metrics made public, updated regularly. Um, some detailed metrics like this one here, a snapshot from a part one time in the project. What percent of the estimate came from the 3D, was estimated with quantities from the 3D model versus a manual, typical estimate versus a conceptual estimate where we still need to flesh out the design. So, just one example of the kinds of metrics that they tracked very regularly and helped guide the process. So the team designed and redesigned work processes uh, together. As you saw, working on the organization and the process. They wanted to avoid making the same mistakes twice. And here is sort of the uh, Dawn Hopper team that sat down and said, okay, what typically goes wrong? And maybe you guys do better here in Australia or in Queensland. Um, but that is sort of uh, the list of things that they found go wrong pretty much on every project. And they said, let's not have these things happen. So what do we need to do so they don't happen? That's where they redefine the process and who works with who. The entire team designed the hospital, not just the architect. The design was out in the open. Everybody could see the problems every week. The structure, for example, was discussed in the context of the architecture program and give and take between those parties. All the systems were coordinated with the structure before they were submitted. This is kind of a bit of a special thing. In California, hospitals have to be approved by a separate agency, and they really look very much at the structural system performance because they want the hospitals to function when after an earthquake. And so, to not have to go back and request changes, they really wanted to make sure that the other systems could actually work with the structure they had in place because the structure became pretty inflexible once it had been submitted to the state agency for approval. Constructability was tested digitally um, and collaboratively. There were absolutely no conflicts allowed between the systems. Um, almost everything on the project was modeled in 3D and then built from the model. The work was planned at different levels by the people you know, actually responsible for that level and coordinated across these levels. Um, Again, leveraging the people, the organization, the process which you see on the right, and then the models, so that everybody was really always on the same page with respect to all of these aspects. So the trade foreman planned the work using, in this case, a 4D model. Um, then they committed to what they would do next week, met each morning to update each other and plan the next day. Um, and this was really the cycle in which the project progressed. Reinforcing steel was, for example, tied on the ground um, after it had been modeled and then put in place. The team really modeled everything they would build in detail because they had to guarantee no rework on budget, on schedule. 
like underfloor foundations and under slab utilities, like foundations under slab utilities, hangers and penetrations in the slab so that they could be located um, and coordinated in time for the layout to happen when only the metal deck was in place and not later when things get much more expensive to build. And they were laid out directly from the model. HVC uh, ductwork was modeled, then sent to the CAD CAM shop for fabrication, cut directly from the 3D model instructions, uh, bent into shape, arranged for shipping, uh, packaged and loaded onto trucks, delivered to the site in the crates, and installed according to the model. And then they laser scanned uh, the actual installation and compared it with the model. Here, things didn't quite get installed as they should have been, as you can see from the discrepancy of these support struts. And in other cases, uh, things got actually installed as they were modeled. So this is sort of the takeaway that this team had at the end of this project, which they felt was very successful, a lot more fun to work on. Basically, integrate early, design your work processes, model what you will build, build what you model, and manage production. We try to do these things in, other, in many projects, of course, but this team really did all of these things, you know, um, with full conviction over the whole life of the project. And I think you'll hear other cases tomorrow from Brian um, that I believe look somewhat similar. So you might say, okay, this is all very good. It's a $300 million project. I mean, of course they can do all these things. So I was curious about that too. So two months ago, and one of my students had the same question. I said, I'm from Peru, we have a very small company. We build little strip malls and things like that, very small projects, a few hundred thousand dollars. Does anything like this help there? So she was curious to find out whether, just for the cost estimating, it would actually pay off to do BIM. So this is a much more smaller, much, much, much smaller limited scope. So for this project, the cost estimating tasks took 41 hours. You see the very simple project, really pretty small project, right? She modeled it in BIM, and then did the cost estimate from BIM. So she found that she could do the cost estimate from BIM in 21 hours. She had to do, she had to spend 32 hours of setup time, but that time she doesn't have to spend on other projects. So on this first project, she spent a few hours more, 53 hours instead of 41, if you count the setup time. But if you only count the actual project time, it was half, including building the 3D building information model. And uh, so she said, well, oh, this is a no-brainer. This is the method that we should use. On top of that, she found mistakes totaling almost 4% and change orders totaling another 6%. About 10% of the project cost could have been improved upon uh, with the building information model, even on a very small project like this. So I just wanted to share this sort of contrasting small, uh, quick case. So, what does it all translate into? You saw the examples from the uh, project, the, the metrics at the beginning of the case study. And uh, we were lucky last year at our annual summer program to have this report from this architect in Portland, Oregon. They had had a quite successful project as well, done with these methods like I showed the case. I could have used this project as a case example as well. And um, which actually happened to be a public project. And so they said, okay, this project went really well. Let's look at our portfolio of projects, recent and ongoing, and compare their performance. And let's group those projects into A, category A, traditional, done how we've always done it with 2D drawings and so on. Type B, a little bit of BIM used. Type C, kind of the case like I showed, integrated team using building information modeling quite fully. So you'll see a rather dramatic um, results on their projects. They looked at their 20 past and present projects. The company is called Sarah Architects. So for example, in terms of design time, they saw a reduction when normalized to a 5,000 square meter office building uh, from 359 days in Type A to 146 days in Type C projects. I mean, these are their data. You know, so you can quibble with it as you like, but these are their data. Construction time, they saw an absolutely dramatic reduction from 600 days to 200, roughly. 
Requests for information were cut in half. Just the processing cost alone saved $100,000, would save $100,000 there. Emails were cut in half. That seems like a good feature to me. <laughs> and um, change orders were also dramatically reduced. And again, just the processing uh, would save $300,000. So rather dramatic results if you compare type A to B to C project. So it's really up to us as an industry to take advantage of this, what looks to me like a more promising method. So much for the organization part, I think that's in our reach today. And we see many projects doing it. It's really just up to us. There's really nothing else that's stopping us. It's not the contract. It's not the contract that's stopping you or us from using these methods and tools. We have seen them employed in all kinds of contractual schemes. Yes, sometimes a little easier or harder, but it's not, it's just an excuse that, from what I've seen. So it's really just up to us to decide we want to work this way or not. So now let me jump a little bit into the future and talk about prediction. How can we make better predictions? Because if we cannot predict the future, then how do we know which future we want? So we need to first predict the future we want. And then you've seen we have now the management methods to actually get the future that we want once we have predicted it. And actually this is very much in line with uh, a lecture that will happen later this week by Alto at QUT. So if you're still in town, you should uh, check it out. So I want to share two cases. One focused on the design of a building, a conceptual design of a building, and then the other one on the design of the process, the construction schedule, uh, to close the loop with the 4D. So this was a case study that we did together with Beck, a multifamily residential project. And the owner wanted to minimize uh, carbon footprint, life cycle impact, and life cycle cost. You had a number of variables to play with in terms of number of buildings, the footprint of the buildings, the orientation of the buildings, um, the number of floors, and so on. And of course, there were constraints in terms of uh, floor area and so on. So pretty, pretty typical design problem. So the project team came up with one design and calculated its performance. 285,000 kilotons of carbon over 30 years, $197 million in life cycle cost for 30 years. They looked for another option that would perform a little bit better. So this option, a little bit simpler design, um, saves $18 million in life cycle cost and a little bit in carbon. Then they looked at a third option and said, hey, and this one also is quite cost effective and saves even a little bit more carbon. So then here you are, owner. Which of these do you like? Three options. It's a pretty typical process as I know it. But the poor owner, how can he or she decide? I mean, maybe we should look at that option number four. Maybe we would find something much better. Or maybe that would be total waste of money and time. We have no idea where in the spectrum of performance these three solutions are. Could there be some much better? or actually are they pretty good. We simply do not know. Because out of 146 billion possible solutions for that case example, we look at really just, sorry, just a very, very few, right? I mean, a, a minuscule amount number. Of course, we have experience. It's not like we do it just like monkeys, but still, we look at really very, very few. So we have, though, now a resource at our disposal, um, which is the computer, and also now cloud computing, where we can buy an hour of computing for something like 10 cents. So employing that, we, put, we, took the, the, sorry, we took the tools that the project team had used in a sort of semi-manual way, building information model, lifecycle cost analysis, and so on tools, stitched them together, put them into an optimization environment, and let that environment figure out what designs would perform best. So here we found uh, some designs that actually performed quite a bit better. Uh, you can see uh, one sort of this debate base design, and then here are the other two design options. And there is a design that performs actually still a bit better than even the improved designs that the uh, you know, computer found uh, versus the experienced project team. You can also get insights in terms of where good performance is coming from. We want low life cycle cost and low life cycle impact, which you see on the right. 
and then each of these axes are the variables that we have to play with and the range of values, 0 to 360 in orientation, this particular footprint parameter E, 0 to 30 meters, and so on. And so you can trace the good performing designs back and see what settings give you strong performance. This is out of over 20,000 options that we looked at. So if you compare the two processes, we see that the conventional process took 162 hours, 60 hours of setup time, and three times 34 hours for each option. We needed actually a little more time with the computer because we had a significant setup time, which would go around dramatically if we did a similar case again. Um, but then we could look at an alternative in 11 seconds instead of 34 hours. We looked at 21,360 options and a total of 210 hours. We were able to um, save 27 million and 10,000 tons of carbon over the base design. So that's the design of the product. Uh, some of the companies are starting to bring this technology in. You really need building information modeling as a basis to take advantage of a method like this. Now, the prediction of the construction schedule, we thought we need to be able to do that better as well. So uh, Rene, one of my PhD students, uh, has been working on what he calls the space constraint method. Um, the idea is to overcome challenges you see in projects, like underutilization of space, um, which on a building right next door, but matched by many other projects we have served around the world, we found that space is used 3% of the time. We basically took pictures, a um, little more frequently than every hour, for several weeks, and we counted, whenever we saw somebody there in the bay, we gave them credit that something was happening, which may or may not be the case, but we also realized we might have missed something occasionally, because we didn't take a picture, it wasn't a video. So, when you go talk with the project team, we said, could you build this project any faster? They said, ah, no way, we're working as hard as we can. And then we see 3% of the construction workspace used, on average, seems to us we could go faster. But then we see other projects, so we need to find a way to maximize work density. Then we see other projects where space is overutilized. So like a project that, uh, a case study where uh, Sylvester Slavenberg sitting in the back of the room, I gave us access to, thank you, Sylvester, at Tripol Airport, um, on a very, very tight schedule um, that really couldn't afford any wasted time. We still found 61 spatial clashes um, costing 18% of the man hours. So in some cases we run into each other, in other cases we are not dense enough. So the idea is to have a method that maximizes the work density while eliminating spatial clashes to give the superintendent, project manager, the shortest possible schedule that you could do if you wanted to carry out the project you know, as tightly as, and as quickly as you, as you could. So this becomes impossible to do manually. Because every step, every move you make, scheduling something in a particular place, you know, prevents other moves, enables other, the next steps, and so on. So we do basically the same thing that we did for the thousands and thousands of options of design. Here, for the schedule, we automatically generate schedules, vary the sequence, and then see which ones perform better. So this is a very, very basic, well, you know, simple, crude, uh, 4D model, or way of making a 4D model, but it's a research prototype at this point. But basically we model each crew and its work and the workspace it needs. And then we arrange this, we play the space chess, as Phil Bernstein calls it from Autodesk, over time, many, many times, and find which one works best. So, um, let me just illustrate this. You'll see this, just to make sure you believe me, this is a research prototype, you'll see that very quickly. But using, one of, using the case study that you saw, uh, where we had 80% lost man hours due to clashes, um, we can run through thousands and thousands of different operations or ways of arranging the schedule. You can see here uh, that, uh, basically, you can imagine here how there's many, many different ways in which you can build this project. Of course, we have to follow the logic of the work, and we have to make sure that there isn't, you know, that crews are not double used and, and the work doesn't happen at the same place, different work doesn't happen at the same place at the same time. But even with these constraints, we can find thousands and thousands of feasible schedules. So, what can we, what can we achieve when we do a simulation like this? When we schedule a project with 
what's arguably possibly the best method today, line of balance, um, location-based scheduling, we find duration of 281 hours on the uh, AccessWise project. When we run SCM, uh, because it has customized space use for every crew, we can um, collapse the project duration 150 hours in the first one, and then when we run it a few more times, we can find solutions that are about 134 hours. And you see similar reductions on the second case that uh, we got from Slavenburg, and then building next door to our building um, at Stanford. We can also now, with this uh, method, see how many crews we actually need. Would it play, would it pan out to use one crew or two crews or three crews? What can you get? And so you can see the duration of the project on the left, and um, you can see here that you probably want to use on this project two crews because you can get a significant reduction in schedule. But then after that you don't get very much a reduction in schedule anymore because probably there's not enough space for them to actually be do much more. And similarly, uh, you can see on the other project there, the second case study from Slavon Group, that probably two crews is the right decision. On the uh, building next door to our building, you can see that uh, you might want to go to four crews, or depending on how far down the curve you want to go. So it's a bigger project, um, more opportunities for crews to work in parallel. Um, but we can now model construction. To my knowledge, this is, at least in our lab, it's the first time we have been able to model all the constraints, the major constraints that we face in construction, the logic of the work, the crew resource availability, and the space availability. The other methods abstract those constraints to some extent, and therefore cannot actually really represent how the work could actually happen. So hopefully I've given you some glimpses um, in terms of where I see things uh, going in the future. Um, once we take advantage of, in this case, multidisciplinary design optimization, but in parallel, we can also leverage big data to learn much more systematically from past projects, which is another set of projects going on that I haven't shared here that also helps us improve our prediction. So, I want to close with a couple quotes from Napoleon. Uh, one of his quotes that I like is, I've made all my generals out of mud. And uh, so what does this mean for us as educators and researchers? What does it mean for practitioners? I think the mud of construction, there's still some of the same mud that we grew up in with, but there is definitely some new mud that exists that we have to learn to deal with and have to expose our people to. So as a company, I think you need a strategy today. How are you going to bring your information model into your own work, into the work of your project teams, together with your partners. You need a strategy how you're going to leverage the automation potential that I showed in the two last case studies. Um, we will not be able to automate everything right away, but I have to believe that some of the companies in the construction industry will learn how to automate important tasks, and I would rather not have to compete with them. So I think you need a strategy for that, and um, that actually plays pretty nicely into skills and uh, expertise that the young generation can bring to our industry. I think if we want to attract creative, smart, young engineers to our industry, we have to bring some of these methods in. We have to use that kind of mud or expose them to this kind of mud. Otherwise, they will simply go and work somewhere else. On the research side, um, I'm pretty excited because with the simulation, the optimization, big data, we can now learn much more systematically, scientifically, about how design and construction and operational buildings actually happens. Still a long ways to go, but I'm really pretty excited about it. So, um, finally, I think, coming back to the role of construction in society, um, other one of my favorite quotes from Napoleon, glory is fleeting. So even though if you do something great, it will be fleeting, but obscurity is forever. So we might as well try to do something great, right? And so I wish everyone a great Congress, inspire others, and hopefully you will also be inspired as you go through the meeting. Thank you.
noteworthy contract this person. And uh, I found the minister was in and out, so with no respect to his schedule for the day. What we really lack in Australia is leadership at the highest level to understand that this sort of productivity is affecting the competitiveness of the economy in Australia. So I'm just putting it to you both. How do we raise this such that there is a genuine interest at the highest level of what this will deliver to the economy? I am merely the introducer for Martin Fisher. Over to Martin Fisher. <laughs> I think um, the project team should, should get together here and, and just work this way and then celebrate the success. Um, this hasn't, well, in the US we were maybe a little bit lucky that the GSA, the General Services Administration, the sort of landlord for the federal government um, that houses a million office workers across the country in 8,000 communities, um, has embraced at least the technology and to some extent the process side of things, maybe the process side not so much yet, but then that matches in parallel a few key owners that have said, okay, we have seen, we've done sort of, we've expected that we get better outcomes, you know, with the same organization too many times already. We have to just try a different approach. And across the US, to my knowledge, there's something, US Canada, there's something like 200 projects, give or take, uh, that, that I know of that are going on um, with the kind of method that I showed in the case example. I guess another thing could be that uh, somehow, if we can orchestrate a delegation to show up in California and other parts of the US, and we can, we can show them the people on the projects are very proud. They would welcome visitors from other parts of the world. They, they want you know, this way of working to spread um, ac across the whole world because there is definitely a global need. Um, but I wouldn't say, and that's just my personal impression, that um, it's really recognized in the US at the highest levels either in terms of the productivity improvements that can be gained and the impacts on the on the whole economy. If we could deliver constructive product, you know, dramatically faster, uh, low cost, higher performance in, in other ways than, than just first cost. Um, that I also wish we had we would have a little bit more uh, recognition. But now with the incoming CIB president uh, Sean, I think I have high hopes that uh, this will take place over the next three years. No, no pressure, Sean. <laughs> uh, good, good passing of the baton. Any other questions of Martin in the next uh, few moments? Please, Bob, if you take the microphone. Yeah, sorry. I have to remark uh, about this. And uh, name and affiliation, thanks. Uh, you know my name, Sylvester Slavenberg. I was involved in one of the projects. Um, about economical impact, that's a very good question. Um, what we think in competition in uh, construction is that we compete only with our uh, competitors, which is not true. Uh, people can invest in whatever they want. They can invest in a holiday, they can invest in a new car. And as I heard the minister saying this morning, in Queensland only there is $25 million of refurbishment in bathrooms from residential or houses, that kind of things. And uh, the problem is when people uh, want to spend money and they have to decide either to spend it on a holiday or uh, go to the internet and easily book a trip, then they do that easier than they spend it on things like construction. Because construction is uh, the old uh, Japanese saying, DDD, dangerous, distance, uh, and, and dirty. And so people think twice because if they want to do something with their uh, office building, restore it, or with their house, uh, and they compare it by going to the internet and book a holiday in one second, they will do the second thing. And what Martin is showing is if you can make things much easier, and at the end of the day, the, the goal for us is that you just can order your refurbishment or your new building, whatever it is, online. The same way you do it with, with uh, uh, booking tickets or buying books at Amazon.com or whatever. And that is the economical impact. 
Uh, there is a book called uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. I uh, recommend you that to read that. That's about that, for example, a restaurant is not competing with another restaurant. A restaurant is also competing with the concert hall. Because people can only once spend their dollar. And the economic impact can be huge because I know lots of people who say, I would love to do something and to invest in construction, but it's too vague. And this can help us to do this. Thank you very much. That was easy on you, Martin, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I learned it from Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvester. Over to Hi, Bob Owen from QUT. Um, it's quite coincidental, or maybe it's not, but we've chosen the same uh, project. So tomorrow, the Digby Christian, the guy that Martin talked about, will be giving a live presentation in the IDS session with a Q&A session, so you can ask him about what I think also is best practice in the world at the moment. Certainly combining the three assets together, the three aspects together. In, in, Q, sorry, in Brisbane and Queensland, there are initiatives. Uh, Brisbane has just started off. I know Tom Fussell is about to kick off a project for uh, building smart Australasia. So we're trying to get that side of it to educate the, the clients. The industry itself is going with Brisbane. So there are efforts, but it's all about closing that cycle that Martin talked about, I think, where you have the, the research, the teaching, and the practice. And um, I suppose one of the questions I do have for you is there is a big push here for public private partnerships, and I'm wondering how this sort of innovation would fit in with that structure. Yeah, I don't know, Brian, if you know maybe something about that, Brian. Um, I haven't seen a private public partnership done this way, uh, to my surprise, but then there haven't been that many private public partnerships. Um, in the parts of the world where these methods seem to be more prevalent. Um, actually, in a few weeks I'm going to a meeting where this exact topic will be discussed for a large redevelopment of a, of a, a NASA property. Um, and uh, I'm a little worried about um, very quickly, we, we seem to be very keen to very quickly divide and conquer of pass a lot of responsibility and then we forego essentially the opportunities from synergies we could get from integration. So one thing I'll be watching out for there is how can we leverage the opportunities from integration, the value we can get versus sort of this certainty in you do this, you do this, you do this that we seem to need to have. And that was certainly on the project team um, when I talked with the project leaders on the on the Castle Valley project that I share. And, and it's great that you uh, have more stories about it because there's definitely a lot more to share. Um, they had to let a few people go in the first few months of the project because they realized that those people simply could not function in this in some way more uncertain, fluid, um, collaborative environment. They wanted to keep the cards close to the chest. And that was not how you're going to find $2 million of savings without reducing you know, the space program, etc., for the client. And so they, they realized that they had to actually you know, let a few people go because yeah, they simply couldn't function in this new way of working. Thanks, Pam. Well, yeah. you saw that PPP, you can come back and tell us. Yeah, that. okay. Yes, so maybe in a month I have a better story. Hopefully. Thank you. And the last uh, question from uh, Tom Fossil to my right. Thank you, Mark. My name is Tom Fussell. I'm from Brisbane, and until a few months ago, I was with Public Works uh, in, in Queensland. Um, I'm particularly <coughs> excited by the simulations and space utilisation that you were presenting to us towards the end of your presentation. But I want to take it back to something, a comment that you made earlier, where you said the contract is no longer a problem. Um, if one is working with PPPs and uh, contractor led forms of contract, that's potentially so, but one of the troubles that I've been wrestling with for some time, given the need to integrate the construction end of subcontractors, and most particularly mechanical subcontractors, into that design decision making process that you spoke about with your teams, how does one make that connection between a design team and a subcontractor before one has a contract in place, if you're using a more traditional system? So you mean if you have a, a traditional delivery, how do you bring the, the subcontractors in? If you cannot formally get them on a team, 
uh, as a part of as a, as a full member of the design group. Contractual relationship with the, or making a commitment to a contractor who is yet to be appointed. Yeah, so I mean, on, on all of the so called IPD projects, integrated project, delivery project, the subcontractors, the key subcontractors, are selected very soon, if not at the same, usually very soon after the general contract is selected. Um, and then they become a member of the design team. Um, and uh, that's, in a way, the leap of faith the owner is making to say, I'll get a better working project out of that decision than to keep my options open in terms of who is going to build the project. Um, and a friend of mine says, well, there's only two kinds of projects in the construction industry. There's design build, and then there's redesign build. <laughs> um, so to avoid, to avoid that talk. Um, if you cannot get them on board uh, for, for various reasons, um, then I think some kind of uh, design assist design process is used, sometimes with success, sometimes with less success, because obviously if the subcontractor isn't certain that he or she is going to build the project, why would they send you the A-team to help you, you know, with the design of that project? So there has to be some way of um, finding a transition from a pre-construction phase into the construction phase that is a little bit more than just a promise. But, but that is one of the challenges um, that almost have to have to address, have to overcome. I mean, it, it seems entirely possible to contract, you know, to spec a different kind of design deliverable that requires the involvement of subcontractors, for example. So that seems to be something that at least some agencies are able to do. Okay, we'll need to call it quits there. I know that uh, Martin uh, enjoys a red wine late at night, um, and he'll be around all day and all night. Uh, he's uh, got an early flight to catch, so if it, if it goes past 5 a.m., uh, he'll probably get a bit agitated. Uh, but for those who do want to have one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, conversation with Martin, I know that he'd be uh, delighted to have a chat uh, throughout the rest of the day and evening. As usual, I'm delighted to have you here, Martin, and uh, making a, a keynote presentation to uh, our Australian and international audience. Um, on behalf of the CIB uh, and uh, QUT and SBE, and of course the audience here today, thanks very much for your presentation. And uh, back to Stephen Kajuski, thanks very much. that takes us through the coffee break. There's just a couple of housekeeping matters uh, that I should just touch on before you disappear out of the room. The welcome reception this evening is not here. It is on the QUT campus, which is across the river. Um, there will be buses running from about 4.45 onwards um, to take those that, that don't wish to walk across to that campus. Uh, for those that do wish to walk, it's a fairly pleasant 20 to 30 minute walk, either down through South Bank and across the Goodwill Bridge or straight across the bridge here into the city and down. So it is quite a pleasant walk, uh, and the weather um, hopefully will be fine to allow that to happen. So 4.45 if you wish to catch buses across. Uh, in terms of the venues, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, everything apart from that welcome reception is here at the Convention Centre. For those that are attending meetings and workshops on the Thursday, everything on Thursday will be at the QUT campus. We are not here on, on the Thursday. Um, with regards to the Congress dinner on the Wednesday night, that's back here. If you still need to purchase tickets for the dinner, for guests, etc., can you please see the ICMS people at the registration desk immediately outside? And if you could do that by 12 today, that would be ideal. Um, we need to finalise numbers fairly quickly. In terms of technical tours um, to the uh, Brisbane City Hall or the QUT Science and Engineering Centre, um, we're trying to confirm bookings for that as well. If you could let the registration desk know which of those you'd like to participate in, that would be also um, uh, appreciated. 
In terms of updated Congress in information, as I said when I started this morning, this is a very full Congress. There aren't any holes in the program anywhere. Um, and we are having to shuffle just the odd thing here or there to accommodate certain things. There's a notice board immediately outside the registration desk, immediately outside this room to your left. Keep an eye on that through the days. Any changes to the program will go up through there. Uh, there is free Wi-Fi access for those that need it within the convention center. If you go, if you just fire up your Wi-Fi link and connect to VCEC link, there is no password, it's completely free, it should connect pretty much automatically for you. For the speakers, um, we're going to hold you to time over these three days. Expect to hear a little bell as the, uh, as the session chairs get agitated. Please, if you can, stick as closely to your timings as possible because we don't have, as I say, any spare capacity in the program itself. If you can make sure that your presentation, once finalised, is to the AV desk next to the registration desk as soon as possible. We'd like to have that loaded up well ahead of your pre presentation if we can. Uh, we can't do that in the room itself. Please see the AV desk outside and get that sorted. Um, this is Brisbane, it's Queensland, it's not that cold. This will probably be the last time you see the organising committee wearing ties. You should feel free to be go, become a little bit more casual. Uh, we don't like to wear ties too often in Brisbane, so feel free to dress down within reason, of course. Uh, but do lose the tie, it makes the rest of us uncomfortable if there's too many in them. Um, we're going to coffee break now. The first concurrent sessions start at 10.30, so in about 25 minutes time. We're using all of the rooms on the, uh, on the far wall as you go outside. We're using this room. If you're in M1 and M2, they're one floor down, but against that side wall again. Uh, so 10.30, please be there for, for those rather than come in and out. And the next keynote and panel session is at 1pm back in this room immediately after lunch. Otherwise, please enjoy morning tea and uh, we'll see you in the concurrence. Thank you.